celebrate together the lamb who was slain before the create the foundation of the earth lord even as the uh, the jewish people um, celebrate their freedom the exodus from egypt god we celebrate our deliverance as well from sin and shame and the power of the enemy so we thank you lord that jesus that you are the ultimate lamb that was slain once and for all for all mankind lord and god we just want to worship you today with our heart and soul and mind and strength god we thank you for your blood god the blood is so powerful god it's through your blood that we are saved set free and delivered and can live a life empowered to be all that you've called us to be jesus
just worship this morning. Let's put our heads together and worship him. That I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. Oh, amazing grace is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You take my cross. You lay down your life. That I'll be set free. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands to him this morning. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you will take my place. That you will bear my cross. Come on, tell him this morning. You will lay down down. Your Make this your life. prayer to him. Your worship to the and King. I would be oh, I would be free. free. Jesus, I sing for for all You've done for me. One more time. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Take my place that you would bear my cross and you lay down your life that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for for all you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for, for all you've done for me. We have so much to be thankful for this morning, God. We worship you. We give you glory this morning. We lift up your name on high, for you are worthy to receive glory and honor and praise. We lift up your name, O oh God. We thank you for your gift of life. We lift you up, Jesus, in this place, for you are worthy to receive the glory and the honor and the praise. We thank you for in your presence. We thank you for right now, God, we can say it was for freedom that you have set us free, God. And we thank you for freedom this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your life. We thank you for your blood. We thank you, oh God, for your love, unconditional love, oh God. We thank you for forgiveness, oh God. We thank you for it was for freedom. Freedom. It was for freedom that you have set us free. And this morning we can sing to you. We can worship you. We can lift you up in this place, oh God. We honor your presence in this room. For you are worthy. For you are worthy. For the King is worthy. The King is worthy to receive glory. The King is worthy to receive praise. Somebody lift up your voice and give him glory. Give him praise in this place. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord this morning. For he is worthy. The King is worthy. The King is worthy to be glorified. 
the king is worthy to be glorified for the king is worthy to be exalted oh we worship you yes we worship you for you are worthy you are worthy oh you are worthy you are worthy God come on worship him worship him for the king is worthy to be exalted the king is worthy to be exalted church sing it out worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain
shout of praise this morning. One, two, three. Yes, hallelujah. Oh, we worship you. Woo. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lift up your hands with me for a moment. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your gift of life. We celebrate our champion this morning for he is worthy to be exalted. You are worthy to be exalted, Jesus. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all you've done. Because you live, we live with you. Because you are alive, we, are, we have access to unlimited life in you, God. In you, Jesus, we thank you for your unfailing love, unconditional love, your mercy, your love, your sweet mercy, your amazing love. So we honor you this morning. 
we honor you, the ultimate champion of all time. We honor you and we exalt you for you are worthy. Worthy is the King of kings. Worthy is the Lord of lords. Worthy is the one. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Yes. Worthy is the Lamb. So we worship you this morning. And we honor you with our lives, with our worship, with all that we are, God. We are so thankful for who you are. Hallelujah. Can we say amen? Can we say amen? Can you find five or ten people and bless them this morning? Praise God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, good morning. Can we say happy Passover? Is that a good thing? Happy Passover. Happy Passover. I think we can say happy Passover, can't we? Yeah. Happy Passover, everybody. Maybe some of you are not expecting this this morning. We love surprises, so we're... We're celebrating Passover and uh, this morning, and uh, we're just, uh, it's been a, uh, I don't like to call them traditions because we don't do things by tradition or religious acts, but it, we, we love to do this every Passover, celebrate uh, this time and the feasts. And, um, and uh, Pastor Stu and Sarah, a few years ago, they kind of, brought this to us and we've since then we've just been uh, running with it it just brings us back to our roots brings us back to who we are and uh and uh i i can't wait to sit there and eat a few things one of them is actually jumping up there it's that apple something something what do you call that thing sure i I call it apple with sugar and cinnamon or something. There's no sugar in that thing. Honey. It's honey. It's honey, sorry. It's the pure it's the pure sugar. Anyways, and this morning we have Pastor Ron and Nancy with us. It's always uh, it's always an honor to have him in the house. And in just a few minutes he's gonna come and he's gonna share the word and then we're gonna go transition right after the word into the uh, our Seder meal this morning. And uh, we it's it's a process, so you're going to sit back, you're going to relax, and we're going to guide you through everything. There's a, a steps, there's a process through it all. And uh, um, I don't know if some of you were here last week, but we have our friends Joel and Rachel in the Bia and Dara, all the way from, they're from everywhere. They were in Portugal, then they were in uh, Mozambique, and then they were in England, and now they're in I think they're like, they're doing the race around the world kind of thing. And I think they're landing now. Joel and Rachel, when uh, uh, I met them in Bible college, when I was, when I went to Bible college, they were, they were uh, in, uh, they had just got married. And uh, they helped me through that process because I went to Bible college alone. Bella was home with Andy. I was away from, from Bella and Andy for a while and they kind of just guided me through it all. So, um, and how the world is small and suddenly things come around and here we are it's all good so um are you ready to bring your tithes and offerings to the lord this morning we're going to receive the offering we've been having such um you know god has been so faithful to us in the favor of god financially has been amazing i've been hearing so many good reports um of how the you know god has really been pouring out um, even just if you weren't here last Sunday, Joel testified of how the Lord told him during the conference to sow an amount, and it was more than he could ever think, you know. And then he thought that was, a, then the Lord switched that to a $300 amount. And then just, you know, days later, he, you know, he had, the Lord had given him exactly amount in his account 
So we don't give because we are waiting for God to give exact the same amount we give because we want to be obedient to his word and we want to just sow into his kingdom. And uh, this morning, it's always, uh, uh, it, we, all, we do this all the time. We're going to receive the tithes and offerings right now. But then we want to take a second offering to bless Ron and Nancy as well in their ministry. And, uh, you know, it's always uh, a pleasure for us when we meet with them and, and they pour into us and, and they come into the river and they pour into the house. So we, we're going to take a, spe a second offering this morning just to bless them, to pour into their ministry, a seed that will multiply because we can never, um, we can never hold back in our seed because... He gives seed to the sower. So uh, as, as we sow, he will increase our seed. So this right now we're just going to take up the tithes and offerings for the house. And just in a moment, we're just going to uh, uh, receive uh, a seed offering into their lives. If you want to give by credit card or debit, you know the process. You can go to the back and do that or put your number clearly on the envelope and... Uh, you know, we believe in discernment, but we don't want to be discerning the numbers on that envelope, okay? So uh, help the process print. So can we stand together as we receive the tithes and offerings this morning? And as we declare, and we, this is not just a, a, a declaration of like, oh, okay, here we go again. We do it again. These are, these are words that we declare into the atmosphere and we declare with faith and believe as we declare these things something is shifting i mean we've been hearing a lot of amazing testimonies of the goodness of god jobs and better jobs and raises and commissions and settlements and finding money and cars being given and all this wonderful stuff so can we just put our voices together and declare together as we receive today's offering we are declaring and thanking the lord for jobs and better jobs raises and bonuses benefits sales and commissions favorable settlements estates and inheritances interests and income rebates and returns checks in the mail gifts and surprises finding money that's paid off expenses decreasing blessing and increase heaven open earth invaded storehouses unlocked and miracles created dreams and visions angelical visitations declarations visitations and divine manifestations anointing giftings and calls positions and promotions provisions and resources to go to the nations souls and more souls from every generation saved and set free caring kingdom revelation Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessing, and increase upon me so I might have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're just going to pass the baskets this morning. And uh, in just a moment, we're going to receive a second offering, and that is a seed offering for Ron and Nancy this morning. It's a fire that burns inside. Nothing can stop us. We'll be running after you. It's a fire that burns inside. It's a fire that burns inside. We got the freedom, the freedom generation. Yes, we are. You are the multiplication over your seed can you stand to your feet and as we sow 
into Ron and Nancy's lives this morning as we sow into, into their lives. And we want to thank God for the increase. Everybody, stand to your feet. Everyone. There you go. Hold your seat this morning. Father, we thank you for seed. We thank you that you give seed to the sower. We thank you, Father God, this morning for Ron and Nancy. We thank you for what they're carrying. We thank you, oh God, for the anointing and the glory and your power. We thank you even this morning what is going to be deposited in our hearts, in this, in this house, God. We thank you for the word that is going to come forth this morning and we declare increase i declare increase over the seed that is going to be sown god we thank you lord that there will be a blessing not only here continue to be a blessing in whatever they go and whatever they do father we declare increase over their lives father we thank you for the open heaven oh god and we thank you oh god for their lives and their love and their anointing that they carry god we thank you in jesus name and god's people said Amen. So let's sow into their lives this morning, okay? We are the risen. We are the risen. We live in life in you. And our passion will not die. So our passion will not die. I'll just grab one of the stands. I'll grab one of the things. We'll be running through the night. And the passion will not die. And the passion will not die. Oh, we are the free, free generation. Sing in the mercy. You are the one who sends the sun in motion. Yours is the glory. Yours is the fire. the glory come on give him a clap off for this morning hallelujah glory to God glory to God Woo! hallelujah <laughs> come on can we put our hands together and welcome Ron this morning? Yay, God. Thank you, Jesus. I love the you, intentionality Jesus. of the house. I love you, Pastor Joe. Thank you, love you. Bless you, thanks. We should do things with purpose. God does. It feels funny being up here. We don't usually do this up here. I do love the intentionality of the house. Even in giving an offering or, or, or receiving an offering, um, Kojo is going to the Sunday school, so the kids can go down with Kojo this morning. So. Didn't get a chance to say hi to Violet. Hey, Violet. Hi, Violet. Say hi to everybody. Violet is, what, number eight? Six. There's that many behind her? Oh, wow. Number 11 is on the way. Grandchildren, for those that don't know. Only four kids. We should do everything with purpose. Everything with purpose. God does everything with purpose. And he does it with excellence, too. Um, we're celebrating Passover this morning. Passover is one of the most important feasts in the Jewish calendar, uh, in the Hebrew calendar. Uh, God commanded them to celebrate this annually on a particular date, 15th of Nisan. Uh, I don't know if that's said right. But every year since, uh, since it began, and it began way back when they came out of Egypt, you know, Israel was for generations uh, part of the Egyptian culture. Pharaoh became afraid of who the Hebrews were becoming, thought that they might actually take over one day, which uh, was kind of a prophetic thought, actually. But, but back then it wasn't a fear. And uh, he 
caused them to be slaves. Uh, so under the bondage of slavery. When we celebrate the, the Passover Seder, we're celebrating the passage from, from slavery, the bondage of slavery to freedom, coming out of slavery and into freedom. And so that's, that's what they were celebrating. But it's much more than just that. It's much more than just uh, a historic celebration of what happened. But God, in all of the feasts, not just Passover, but in all of the feasts, God was telling a bigger story. He was always telling something, foretelling something that he was doing in his overall plan. God has always had a plan, and the plan is still uh, right on the timeline that God has it for. So the Passover was really looking toward Christ on Calvary. He was really looking forward. It was the story of our salvation. You know, that's what the Passover is about, the story of our release from slavery to sin to the freedom of redemption. And so very, very important. I mean, going back over the, the original Passover, and so, you know, a deliverer was selected, Moses. Uh, God told him, go to Pharaoh and, and demand, Pharaoh, let my people go so they can serve me. And, of course, Pharaoh wasn't very agreeable to that. I mean, you leave, lose a lot of free labor. You know, a whole nation that's building your country, economy's built on this, it kind of caused a little bit of turmoil. So he wasn't too pleased with that. So Moses advised him there's going to be a plague that's going to come on. God's going to try to change your mind about this. And so through a series of ten plagues, each being arguably more terrible than the one before, and through a few of those plagues, Pharaoh relented and said, well, I'll, I'll let your people go. And then when you know, Moses prayed and the Lord lifted the plague, then Pharaoh recanted. And, and the Bible says that God hardened his heart. And so Pharaoh recanted, wouldn't let the people go, and so the plagues continued until the, finally the last plague, which was the, the slaying of the firstborn, pretty horrible, pretty bloody. The slaying of the firstborn and the... The Hebrews were told that, you know, slay a lamb, sprinkle the blood over the doorpost, and when the angel of death comes, he'll pass over your house. He'll go by your house and go to the next one. And every door that didn't have the blood, the firstborn would be slain. And so that happened, and uh, there was a lot of mourning in Egypt the next morning. Terrible time. Pharaoh finally, out of his own grieving heart, his own firstborn son was slain, let the people go. They left. And even after they left, Pharaoh regretted his decision and went after them with his army. And so the armies of Egypt, with their chariots and horsemen and the whole thing, and went after and pursued them. And they were trapped between the Sea of Reeds, the, the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army. And God said to Moses, put your rod over the water. And the water's going to divide. Your people will go through on dry land. And so they went through. And Pharaoh with his army came in behind into the sea. And uh, they're looking and they're being pursued. What do we do now? God said, put your rod over the waters again and they'll return and swallow up the Egyptian army. And, uh, and God caused turmoil to come even amidst the Egyptians, the wheels began to fall off the chariot. The Egyptians are quoted in the Bible as saying, you know, even their God fights for them, let's run. And so they started to turn away from the Is, uh, Israelis, the Hebrews, but they couldn't get away because now their chariots don't work and they're mogged down in the bottom of the, the sea. The waters came up and the Bible records that not one of the Egyptian pursuers survived. And Miriam, on the other bank, began to bang her tambourine and sing a song of freedom, of deliverance, of the tremendous miracle that God had done in bringing them out of slavery. That's what we're celebrating this morning. And when we think about that, I mean, it's a tremendous thing to celebrate, but I want, I want us to understand the bigger picture when God's pointing toward Calvary, when he's pointing toward the celebration, and the cel celebrations are always about remembering what God has done, but it's also pointing toward what God is doing. 
What has he done? Why has he done it? What's the bigger plan and where do we fit into this? So, there's a couple upper room uh, experiences that have happened in history that have greatly impacted the history of mankind. In his book, Life Looks Up, Charles Templeton remarked about how ironic it was that the course of human history was impacted both positively and negatively by two upper room experiences. One of them was in a drab apartment in London's west side. I say drab apartment, it was dirty, it was curtainless. Uh, there were stacks of articles on the table, worn manuscripts, and sitting at the table there's a man working on his writings. And it's a manifesto that would overthrow governments, would enslave millions of people, and affect the course of history for several generations. The man's name was Karl Marx. And the document he was writing was Das Kapital, the handbook for the communist revolution. That was an upper room experience. There's another upper room that figures in the course of history, located in one of the oldest cities of the room, Jerusalem. Here there's a table spread where 13 people were gathered to share a meal. Hear the words of a man whose love and sacrifice would make an eternal impact on human history. And so today I want to look back to that upper room experience with Jesus and the 12 disciples. And I want us to consider exactly what happened at that meal. Because that was the, the real Passover celebration. That Jesus was bringing home the meaning of what the Passover was all about. That moment in time, immediately preceding Calvary, just a few hours before Jesus went to the cross. So in Luke twenty-two sixteen, Jesus said to his disciples, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. We need to understand that Jesus completely understood what the Passover was about. He wasn't deceived. He didn't misunderstand any part of it. And Jesus was looking forward to the cross, believe it or not. Because his actions showed that he was doing all the preparations necessary so things would happen the way they were supposed to happen. He was looking forward. He was looking at the cross. He was aware of it. He knew what it meant. He didn't... I don't think he relished the thought of it. There was some turmoil in his heart about it. But he was looking forward to it for, the, for what it meant. He said, with fervent desire, of desire to eat this Passover. And there's particular times and events, even in our lives, that as we approach them, that there's, there's a degree of seriousness, there's a degree of, of uh, import that they carry with them. That because of the circumstances, because of the pressure involved, we might have limited time to say what we need to say. And yet in those, those, in those particular times, what we say, is very, very important. What we say is critical because it speaks to our most deeply cherished values. There was a movie that Bob Keaton starred in. It was called My Life, and he played uh, the role of a fellow by the name of Bob, Bob Ivanovich. And Bob was a young man with a pregnant wife, and he just got the horrible news that he was diagnosed with ter terminal cancer. And it's possible that he wasn't even going to live to see the birth of his son. And so Bob was... As a looking forward to be a new father, said, like, this sucks. All of my dreams, I mean, I'm, I'll never get to know my son. So he set out to create a series of videos. And in those videos, he tried to teach his son all the things that a father would normally teach his son. How to shave, how to drive a car, how to jump start a dead battery, play basketball. He tried to do all those things that, that he wasn't going to be there to share with his son in person. And he knew that the only influence he was going to have his son was, would be through these videos. He would never know his son, but hopefully his son would know him a little bit. It would know how much he'd cared. It was important enough. But whatever he was going to do, whatever he was going to say, he had to do it now. I wonder... If everything was at stake, if, how do we make sure that our message gets through? If we want our children, if we want our, our students, if we want 
those around us to know what's important to us. If we want them to really hear what we have to say, how are we going to say it? What do we do? If we had a Last Supper to attend, if I had a Last Supper and I was gathering my family around me one last time, and this was the last time I get to speak to them, what are the things that I'm going to say to them? Because what I say speaks to my most cherished values. And I hope what I say is going to be reflective of how I've lived. So Jesus said to his disciples, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Before I suffer. His disciples are hearing this and going, what are you talking about? This isn't the plan. This isn't what we... This isn't why we came to Jerusalem. We came to celebrate. We came to celebrate the Passover. Going from slavery to freedom. This is, a, this is a party. This is a celebration. We're happy. We're talking about suffering. Fervent desire. Christ expressing an intensity of longing about sharing this short time together. There's things on his heart that he has to communicate tonight. This is the culmination of his ministry. Of the three years that he had with them, this is the last moments. Everything he's taught them becomes summarized in the next couple hours. Jesus was setting them up to hear the climax of all of his teachings. Christ was looking forward to the cross deliberately, purposefully, very intentionally. And we read in John 13, 1, as they're in this meal, John 13, 1, verses 1 through 5. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, knowing all these things, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now here he is, the Son of God, washing feet as an expression of, of what was about to occur at Calvary. And we need to understand the context of what's happening. I don't know if you've had a chance to participate in a, in a wa foot washing ceremony or not. I have. It's very moving. It's very passionate. It's very impactful. And it gives us the opportunity to take, cause, to take pause and to understand our relationships with one another. The world gives a lot of credit to hierarchy, giving homage to people that are above us in the chain, wherever that chain might be, whether it's in society, whether it's in work, whether, you know, regardless of where it is. There's a hierarchy. There's a pecking order that exists in the world. And we need to understand in the kingdom it's not like that. There's not a pecking order. We don't have a king that looks down on us. We have a king, a sovereign, that raises us up and treats us as equals. That's pretty hard to believe. He wants us to be seated with him in heavenly places. He doesn't want us to serve him. He wants us to reign with him, to rule and to reign with with him. God doesn't look down on us. The first misconception of God is that he's a, a God that's looking for a fault to take it, pick a fight with. And that's not who he is. Not at all. As his hands were on their feet, as Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, he's loving them. He's got every one of them individually on his heart. And he's loving them through his hands as he's washing the dirt off their feet. 
And he's projecting that love not only into them, but into every person that will ever, ever live. He's thinking about you as he's washing the disciples' feet. He came to serve, and he's demonstrating that he's willing to serve, projecting that infinite love across the centuries, about to pay the ultimate price, foremost on his mind, and the reason for going to Calvary was also preeminent in his thoughts. He knew why he was doing this, and it was all about us. It was about you. It was about me. How could he not find some way to express this tangibly? And he did it through washing their feet. Sharing this last meal with his disciples, wanting to enjoy those last few moments, wanting to leave a lasting impression that would carry them through the difficult times ahead. That love that he projects through the centuries that finds us today here, he finds hearts that are lonely, that are desperate, that are worn, that are troubled, that are in pain, that have experienced loss. He finds those hearts even today. He finds your heart today, wherever it is. And he projects love to you. He expresses and he offers love to you, to me, right here today. And that connection was felt and known by Jesus centuries ago in the upper room as he's washing their feet. I don't believe the disciples had the capacity to fully understand what was happening. I don't think they understood. Peter himself said, Lord, not me. Don't wash my feet. You, I mean, I should be washing your feet. Peter, you don't understand. If I don't wash your feet, you can have no part of me. He wasn't just talking about washing feet. There's something more happening here. Peter, in an emotional response to that shocking statement, if I don't wash your feet, you can have not my feet only, but my head also. Wash all of me. Good move, Peter. Good move. Because <laughs> Jesus wanted them to understand what's happening. The key, and, and he was demonstrating the key to personal and corporate revival for every one of us. John 13, 34 Jesus made this simple statement just a few minutes later. He said, love one another. As I have loved you, even so you must love one another. The way I've loved you, you need to love each other. By this, not by, because you can preach, not because you're anointed, but by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. How often do we fight? How often do we project anything but love and but the only way that people are going to know we're his disciples is if we love one another. Because that's what he projected. That's who he is. That's what he did. He loved them. He could have chosen to do all kinds of other things. He chose to love. He chose to demonstrate love. Serving one another may not seem like a big deal. It may not seem very important in the bigger scheme of things. But I tell you this, in the economy of heaven... There is no greater thing you can do than to lay yourself down to serve another. Because that's who Jesus is. Think about who he is. What did he do to come here? He laid it all down. John 13, starting at 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. He just did this. He says, do you understand what I have done for you? Because he knew they didn't. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So, what did he do? Jesus laid aside his garments that night, just as he had laid aside his glory in heaven and his privileges as the Son of God. He washed men's feet, a menial act of service, just as he died the degrading death of a criminal. And when Jesus had finished washing their feet, he took up his garments and he returned to his place of honor at the table. Just as he was taken up from the grave, 
and was seated again with God the Father. In this upper room, the Son of Man stripped off his garments, got down on his knees, and he washed the dirt off the feet of those whom he had called to follow him. Do you understand now? As a fitting symbol of his whole life and leadership, he washes the dirt off our feet. He washes the sin off of our lives. And if I don't do this, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, you can have no part of me. Do you understand what I've done for you? Do you understand why it's necessary? Passover. Which brings us to Jesus' words in John 14, 1. And he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. All this is going on and the disciples are in a state of turmoil. What is he saying? What is he doing? What does this mean? What's going on here? Like, we don't get it. After three years, we still don't get it. Don't let your hearts be, their hearts were troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Troubled. Inward commotion. Taking away the calmness of our mind, of our spirits. It disturbs our equanimity. It causes disquiet. We're restless. We're troubled. They were troubled, and the troubler in the scene was Jesus. How can I not be troubled? You're throwing everything upside down. I am troubled. Trust me. You trust in God? Trust also in me. Don't be troubled. The word heart in Greek is, is the word cardia. It's the seat in the center of all physical and spiritual life, the soul or the mind, as it is the fountain and seat of thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, endeavors. It's the inner man. It's the real you. The heart is the real you. When Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled, don't you be concerned about this. Don't let this upset your apple cart. Relax. Everything's okay. I do have it under control. It's not the way you thought it would be. But it's okay. Jesus knows he's going to go through unspeakable trial, beating, and crucifixion. He knows this. And yet, he's still thinking of the disciples, that they would be concerned, that they would be troubled. He can handle it. Can they? He's worried about them. They're not facing trial. Jesus is worried about them. Amazing. Ever the loving servant father, God, you know, the leader that is just all about his followers, how are you doing? I'm about to be killed. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be beaten. Yeah, you're not even going to be able to recognize me when they're done. Then I'm going to be crucified. But are you okay? You all right? Don't be troubled. Don't let this wah bother you. It's okay. It has to happen. It's okay. I'm okay with it. You need to be okay with this. How can I be okay with this, Jesus? How can I possibly be okay with this? In the context of the evening and what was about to transpire, Jesus was saying they needed to strengthen their faith. He's telling them, difficult days are ahead. Sounds familiar? I need you to be strong. I need you to stand firm in your faith. And you need to trust me like you've never trusted me before. So in the mix of anxiety and troubled hearts, Jesus reassures his friends. He reassures them of six things. We have a place in God. His heart is for us. Just by the way he's talking to them. What he's facing and his concern, we have a place in God. His heart is for you. To make sure you're okay. That he's going to return. His absence, his parting is only temporary. That we can know the Father and we can know him intimately, personally. That we have an advocate in Jesus and we have an advocate in the Holy Spirit who will be our our companion, and our teacher in all things. And that the work and the vision of the kingdom would always increase. But it wouldn't increase by our efforts or our labor. It would increase by the work of the Spirit. And that he would answer them. They would have greater access than ever before. He was now giving them permission to use his name. I'm going away, and I'm leaving you the power of attorney to use my name. And you can do all the things and even more than what I did. This is amazing stuff. 
Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you so that you fit in. I go to prepare a place so that you are part of the bigger picture. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also, that you can make your dwelling place in me. Then Jesus starts talking to them about being fruitful. John 15, verses 1 through 6. I am the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me and I in you. Now, we need to understand the context of that verse because people have misinterpreted that so often. They've interpreted it to be a fearful thing. Every branch that does not bear fruit, he takes away with the context that he cuts it off the vine and throws it away. That's not what this verse is saying. He doesn't do that. Have you thought that that's what that means? That's not what it means. That word he takes away is from the word arrow, A-I-R-O, to raise up, to elevate, to lift up, to raise from the ground, to take upon oneself and carry what has been raised up. So every, every branch that doesn't bear fruit, he raises it up off the ground. He turns it toward the sun, which would be him. He turns it toward the sun. Have you ever, remember that old song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We become what we see. He turns our eyes toward him so that we can bear fruit so that we become like him. He doesn't chop us off and throw us away. He bears us up. He lifts us up from the ground so that we have an environment which is conducive to fruit bearing. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts from the dirt so that it can bear fruit. He elevates us. He turns us, our face toward him. Mark 2.11 says, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Take, arrow, take up, lift it up. When you made a decision to accept him, when we decide to serve the Lord, he abides in us and we abide in him. Abiding in him is an important part of the fruit-bearing process, abiding in the vine. If we're fruitful, he will make us more fruitful. That's what the verse said. Those who are fruitful, he will make more fruitful. And if we're fruitless, he will lift us up to make us fruitful. The end result being that we all become fruitful. He's not choosing to keep some and throw some away. He's making us fruitful. John 2 and 8 uses a different connotation of, of the word take. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feet. And they feast and they took it. And that was the word pharaoh, to carry a burden, to be conveyed or born, to bring forward in a speech. That's what that word means. I just wanted to show that so there's a context of what the word take can mean in different contexts. But in the term of being bearing fruit, the word take is in the context of lifting us up and pruning us and making us fruitful. The point is that we need to stop struggling. It's not your job to produce fruit. It's your job to bear the fruit that he produces in you. And there's a world of difference. If I'm trying to make fruit, it's going to be really difficult because I don't know how to make fruit. Because it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit creates the fruit. The Spirit produces the fruit. But I bear the fruit. The fruit becomes evident in my life as He works in me, as He abides in me and I abide in Him. Galatians 5 says these things. Now the works of the flesh are evident, or they're obvious. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, the Amplified Bible says this, the fruit of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Holy Spirit, brackets, the work which His presence within accomplishes. It's not my job to make fruit. It's the job of the Holy Spirit as I allow Him access into me to work through me at the work that his presence accomplishes in me. It's the fruit of the Spirit being born in my life. I bear the fruit, but I don't produce it. It's not my work. It's not my effort. 
It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. I can't make fruit, but I can bear fruit. I can be fruitful. 1 John 4, 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. All of this is in the context of the, the Last Supper, the upper room experience with Jesus. The important things that he wants to make sure we understand before he heads on out. John 16, 1 to 4, these things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They'll put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Meaning, now I'm going. John 16, 16 to 24, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name, but ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and you will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I've spoken to you that you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. You're not judged. The ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. He will take what is mine and declare it to you, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. Uh, alos, that word Greek, is for another. Another meaning the same as. He's going to give you another helper just like me. That's what Jesus was saying. The, another helper, the Alos helper, that looks just like I look, he does exactly the kinds of things that I would do. You won't be able to tell the difference between him and me. Another that looks just like me. You'll feel comfortable with him because, he's, because you know me. You'll know him. This is amazing stuff. John 15, 26. When the helper comes, whom shall I... Whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. That helper, parakletos, summoned, called to one side, especially called to one's aid, my personal divine help. Holy Spirit, the parakletos, the helper, the comforter, the one who will teach you all the things that you need to know. Aletheia, truth, objectively, what is true in any matter under consideration, authentic living, personal excellence. Isn't that great? The, what Jesus is providing, the, the, the access he's giving us at this upper room, this celebration of Passover, we're going to be fruitful. I don't have to be afraid. All the things that he has, you know, this, this son of man who God has given everything under his authority is giving himself up for us that we will be okay. He's making provision for us through the Holy Spirit and we'll be able to love one another, not through our own natural love, but a supernatural love that he endows upon us to be able to do things that we wouldn't have been able to do. John 16, 8, which he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The agleco, conviction, to bring to light, to expose, to convince, to reprove. Holy Spirit will come and give everyone a clear revelation of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Holy Spirit wants to convince the world that Jesus is the cure for sin. There is only one cure for sin, and his name is Jesus. That's why we celebrate Passover. Because I want to be free. 
And I'm glad that I am free because of the Lamb whose blood was shed on the doorposts of my life. Even greater is God's wonderful grace, Romans 5.15, and his gift of forgiveness to many through this man, Jesus Christ. Acts 26.18, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The note there is that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Do you know how you get forgiveness? How do you become forgiven? You receive it. Really. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. But you can receive it. Isn't that nice? Isn't that glorious? Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it's not the, the 14 ways to the 13 concepts to the work that I have to do to receive this accolade to maybe qualify to get into the lottery to be forgiven. No. <laughs> this is great. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you died for my sins. Then you're forgiven. Oh, it's that easy. It was that easy. You don't earn forgiveness. You don't work for forgiveness. But you receive forgiveness. You receive it. John 16, 10. Convicting of righteousness. Because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Holy Spirit wants to convince the world that Jesus did it right. He did it the only way that was right. He lived the perfect sinless life and he laid himself down. The spotless lamb of God paid the price, the penalty for sin, and he did it for us and we receive it. Convincing them of sin. Jesus did it right. Convincing them of righteousness, that there is a righteous way to approach God. There's a way to find ourselves in alignment with God and it's through Jesus. Romans 5.17, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. His body took on my sin. My sin was laid on his body on the cross that I would be counted righteous. Hallelujah. I am righteous. Not because I'm all that, but because he died for me. I'm righteous because he paid the price for me. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. But he gave it willingly, lovingly for me, for you. Hebrews 9.12, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. It's no longer an annual sacrifice that the blood of bulls and goats will cover my sin for a, a temporary period of time. But he did it once and for everybody, for all time, for all the sin that ever was committed or ever would be committed. He's already forgiven you for the things that you're going to do down the road that would be called sin. He's already forgiven them. It's already under the blood. He already knows about it. You don't even have to ask for forgiveness. He already did it. You receive it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing that I can do that can separate me from his love. There's nothing I can do that can cause me to be... Hold on now. We're about to shoot a sacred cow. That can cause me to be less righteous. Because in my heart of hearts, I want him. I love him. And I mess up from time to time. I do. I mess up from time to time. And so do you if you were honest this morning. And I'm sure you all are. Once in a while, we do it wrong. But he's already seen it. He's already forgiven it. If there's something I had to do to make that right, if there's something I had, then, then I couldn't receive forgiveness. I would have to earn it. But I don't have to earn it. I receive it because he's done it. He's done all of it once for all. One time. For all, I don't have to crucify him again. He doesn't have to pay the price one more time. He did it once for all, for all time. He's done the price. He's paid for my sin. Every sin I will ever commit in my entire life has already been redeemed. And I can walk 
not in slavery, but in freedom. Passover. I've been passed over. You've been passed over. Passover is a glorious time. It's a wonderful celebration for what it means personally, not just historically, but personally. It's relevant to me today. Passover means something today, this morning, and it means something to the future when I might still mess up just a little bit or even a lot. He's already forgiven me. And I can walk in that forgiveness. I don't have to... to I mean, there's been times in my life when I've messed up and I'm going, oh, how do we even go back and pray? I, sh I knew better. I, why, why did I do that? I, I'm such a dodo. I'm such a... I'm so useless. I'm... I'm so weak sometimes, those habits of the flesh, like, why, why? Oh God, can you even forgive me? And he's saying, what are you talking about? Well, I've come about this particular issue so many times before. You have? Yes, I have, don't you remember? No, I actually don't. But God, you don't have to remind me. I don't remember and I don't want to remember. If you've come to me, I forgave you and I threw it in the sea of my forgetfulness, never to be remembered against you again, ever. I don't know if you've ever been here before, but if you're at my throne of grace asking for forgiveness, you have it. That's why I died. Why would you even have to ask? Of course you're forgiven. I just want relationship with you. Every time we come to the cross, every time we come looking for forgiveness, we have it because he forgave us. He died for your sin so that you would be forgiven. Always. He wants you to know freedom in walking in relationship. He longs for the relationship with you. Every time you come, it's the first time. And of course you're forgiven the first time. Who doesn't get a second chance? You'll never ever get past the second chance because that's all there are with God. There's second chances. And that's a good thing. And he convicts of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Holy Spirit wants to convince the world that Satan, once and for all, is defeated. He has no hold on you. He has no power he has no authority over you. Hebrews 2.14, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Colossians 2.15, in this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. The good news, Jesus is the only cure to sin. He declares you righteous and your accuser is destroyed. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, but has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who, know, no, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He has made us alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of a requirement that was against us, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We receive forgiveness. Beautiful. Jesus was cursed on the tree in our place, bore our sin in his own body. He didn't bear his sin in his blood. He bore it on his body. And as his blood was shed, his pure, perfect, spotless blood, washed away all the sin. His blood was just as holy on the cross as it ever was. As he offered the sin sacrifice to God, he was covered with pure, innocent, justifying, redeeming, sanctifying blood 
and he was able to dismiss his spirit into his father's hands. Jesus is the only cure for sin. He declares you righteous. Your accuser is destroyed. You are forgiven, healed, and free. And Christ left his disciples with an unforgettable evening. He won't remember Jesus washing their feet. Who doesn't remember Jesus washing their feet? Do you remember the day you came to Christ? Who doesn't remember Jesus washing their feet? I'm sure the disciples had that night in their memory for the rest of their lives. Jesus washed my feet. And later on, they understood it. Especially Peter. They carried that night forward them through some tough times. The next few days, the next few weeks were rough. But it carried them. And I want to close with these final parting comments. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks. Saying. Now get this. This struck me. This, as I was studying this, this really struck me. As they were eating, Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup when he had given thanks. Given thanks. He gave it to them and they drank. They all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. Do this in remembrance of me. Before his body was broken, before his blood was shed, he gave thanks. He was thankful for the cross. He was thankful for the cross. So when I said he was looking forward to the cross, I know people would say, no, I mean, you have to look at Gethsemane. He did not not want the cross. No, I, I'm telling you, he was thankful for the cross. He took the bread and he gave thanks. He said, this is my body, broken for you. This is the blood of my covenant, shed for many. I'm giving thanks for this. Do this in remembrance of me. When you remember, be thankful. As we participate in the Seder meal today, let us do so joyfully, thankfully, celebrating our passage from slavery of sin to the freedom of redemption, to the freedom of forgiveness, to freedom of salvation through the bread of the precious Lamb of God that by faith, is applied to our hearts. What do you say about this Jesus? He's good. All the time. Let's stand. And let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful that you sent your son Jesus to die. And Jesus, I'm so, so very thankful that you looked forward to the cross and you chose, you decided that it was worth it. And that through that act of love, my whole life can happen. I receive freedom. And I'm no longer a slave because of your great love. I'm so thankful for that. And I receive that right now. And help me always to remember, help all of us to always keep in remembrance of the great love with which you love us. And you did love us and you continue to love us. And that at any moment in time when our hearts are in pain, when our hearts are lonely, when we're experiencing doubt, when there's things that assail us and circumstances are tough, that we need to just look towards you and we receive freedom from the pain that's around us and you heal and you bring us back into relationship with you because of your great love. And I'm thankful, Lord, that when we're struggling with stuff, that you lift us up to make us fruitful and effective in the kingdom of God. And so we celebrate this Passover with such great joy We're so indebted to you, a debt we could never repay. But you've not asked us to repay it. You've simply asked us to walk in fellowship with you. 
that you delight in us. You actually delight in us. Help us to delight in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.